Hello, in this video I'm going to show you how to extract trees from LiDAR data. We'll begin with the digital surface model and the digital terrain model. From this, we create a normalized digital surface model. Then, we test different neighborhood sizes with focal statistics, we set a minimum height so only real trees are kept, and finally we convert everything into vector points. Alright, let's get started with the video. First, we're going to import the LiDAR data we have available. In this project, we're working with two datasets, a DSM with a 50 cm resolution and a DTM also with 50 cm. That means we have a very detailed coverage of the area we'll be analyzing. Let's bring these into ArcGIS Pro. The first step is to generate a normalized DSM or NDSM. We'll start by comparing the DSM, which includes both the terrain and above ground objects, with a DTM, which only represents the bare ground. By subtracting the DTM from the DSM using the raster calculator, we get the NDSM. This will highlight the heights of objects above the ground, in this case, trees. Before we start, I can show both so we can see the differences. We can see that the DTM represents a smoother surface without much roughness, while the DSM already shows the different objects present in the study area. As I mentioned, the NDSM can be calculated using the raster calculator. So go to Analysis, then Tools, and search for the tool. Here, in the text box, we double-click the DSM, use the subtraction symbol, and then double-click the DTM. Choose the folder and the name that this new element will have. I will just simply call mine NDSM and then click Run. Now we see we have altitudes between minus 0.5 and 22 meters, we can even change the color ramp to get a more precise sense of what we are analyzing here. Okay, so here we already see the tree tops. It is also important to highlight our study area. It consists only of natural terrain with no artificial structures. It contains some agricultural fields, areas with trees, and a small stream running through. The highest areas correspond to tree canopies, while the terrain and lower vegetation are represented at lower values. We can even use the swipe tool to check it. So, at this stage we already have the NDSM prepared, and this will serve as the foundation for the following steps. The next step is to use the Focal Statistics tool. This tool allows us to analyze neighborhoods of cells and calculate the maximum value in each neighborhood. This helps us identify the maximum canopy height of each tree. We start by selecting our NDSM as the input raster and we define the output as FS5 meaning focal statistics with a neighborhood of 5 by 5 cells. In the parameters we set the neighborhood to a 5 times 5 window and the statistics type needs to be maximum, because we are interested in the highest value in each tree canopy. Let's click Run. We need to repeat this operation multiple times with different neighborhood sizes because the chosen neighborhood has a strong impact on the final result. After the 5x5 neighborhood, we run again with a 10x10 window, naming the output focal statistics 10. We then repeat for 20x20, named focal statistics 20, and 30x30, named focal statistics 30. As we increase the neighborhood size, the images become more generalized and appear more pixelated. With smaller neighborhoods, we preserve detail, but we may create too many peaks per tree. 
The idea is to test several variations so that later we can decide which neighborhood works best for our study area. If we select one result and then another, we can clearly see that the larger the neighborhood value, the more pixelated the image appears. This is perfectly normal since the analysis is being carried out over a larger area. Since we only want to extract actual trees, we need to define a minimum canopy height. Our currently normalized digital surface model shows values between about 0 and 23 meters, but we will only keep trees taller than 2 meters. This means we will lose some smaller vegetation, but it gives us a more accurate dataset of significant trees. To apply the height filter we use the Sentinel tool, we start with the result from focal statistics with a neighborhood of 5x5 five five cells. So here in the parameters we set the input raster as focal statistics 5. In the conditional expression we specify that if the value is less than 2 meters then it will become no data. Then for the input false raster or constant value we choose again the same raster focal statistics 5. For the output name we give it Sentinel 5, so that is clear that this layer comes from the 5x5 five five neighborhood. The environment settings do not need to be changed for this operation. We then run the tool and we can see that the resulting values now range from 2 to about 23 meters. We repeat the exact same procedure for the other neighborhood sizes. We take focal statistics 10 as input, define the condition that values lower than 2 become no data and keep the rest. We call the output set node 10 and run the tool. Then we do the same with focal statistics 20, producing, producing set node 20. And finally with focal statistics 30, producing set node 30. After running all four, we now have four different filtered rasters, each corresponding to one of the neighborhood sizes, and all of them only contain three heights above two meters. It's important to emphasize why we set this threshold. Our NDSM contains values between 0 and around 23 meters. By removing everything below two meters, we are focusing only on trees of significant size. Of course, this means that some smaller vegetation is lost, but that is acceptable in order to create a more reliable dataset of larger trees. Another important point is that this method is valid because our study area contains only natural terrain. If we were working in an artificialized landscape, for example with houses or other buildings, the tool will also preserve the roof peaks or any objects taller than 2 meters. In those cases, it will be essential to first create a mask to remove all urban features before continuing with the workflow. Now that we have the four sentinel layers, we can isolate the trees themselves. For this, we return to the raster calculator, but this time we use it in a different way. Instead of simply performing a subtraction or multiplication, we create a condition using the con function. Let's open Raster Calculator. In the expression, we write that if the value of the NDSM pixel is equal to the value of set null 5, then return the value of the NDSM pixel. Otherwise, return no data. For that, we type con and then open parentheses. We double click on the NDSM raster, then double uh, equal signs, then we select the uh, set node 5, then comma, and then double click on the NDSM as well. On the final part of the expression, we type none and close the parentheses. This condition keeps only the pixels that represent the highest peaks, removing all the others. Select the name, in my case I will call this T5, and click Run. 
now I will just change two things here in the raster calculator, the raster corresponding to each set null and the output name to match the number of neighbors. And we do this for the set null 10, set null 20 and set null 30. When we analyze the different outputs, we can compare how the choice of neighborhoods affects the result. With 3 is 5, we obtain too many points per tree crown. In some cases, a single tree is represented by several peaks, which is not really uh, realistic. With tree stand, the number of peaks is reduced, but sometimes it still shows more than one per tree. With tree is 20, the result is much closer to reality, often showing only one point for each tree. This point that we see here on the screen represents the fact that this pixel marks the highest point of this tree. In other words, in this example, using a neighborhood of 20 cells seems to be the best option. Let's finish by looking at the neighborhood of 30 cells and it is clear that we lose a lot of information, both in this more forest area and in this agricultural area. Let's also look at the neighborhood of 20 here. We are still losing a lot of information. With the neighborhood of 10, we managed to get um, more detail. Let's also check the neighborhood of 5. Yeah, the neighborhood of 5 really seems to be the best option for this part, while the neighborhood of 20 works better for the area with taller trees. Up to this point, all our results are still raster data. To make the analysis easier and to integrate with other GIS layers, we can convert the trees into vector points. For this, we use the raster to point tool. We start with trees 5. In the parameters, we set the input raster as trees 5, select the field value, and for the output name, we use trees 5 as well. We run the tool and obtain a shapefile where each pixel that represents the tree peak is now converted into a point. We repeat the same procedure for trees 10, trees 20 and trees 30, naming the outputs accordingly. Now we have four point shapefiles that correspond to the different neighborhood sizes. These vector layers make it much more easier to visualize, to analyze the tree distribution and to integrate with other vector datasets. By comparing the point shapefiles, we can better understand the strengths and weaknesses of each neighborhood size. Trees 5 produces an exaggerated number of points, spinning crowns into multiple detections. Trees 10 is more balanced but can still duplicate points for a single tree. Trees 20 is often the most realistic option, producing a good match between points and actual trees observed in the canopy. Tree 30 simplifies the canopy too much, removing many trees and losing important detail. Depending on the characteristics of the landscape, the most appropriate solution may even involve combining results. For example, in agricultural areas with small groups of trees, tree stand may give the best representation. In forest areas with widely spaced trees, trees 20 could be the most accurate. The choice depends on the specific context and the goals of the project. Through this workflow, we were able to extract individual tree peaks from LiDAR data and convert them into shapefiles of points. The steps were creating the normalized digital surface model by subtracting the digital terrain model from the digital surface model, running focal statistics with different neighborhood sizes to generate several variants, applying set null to remove all values lower than 2 meters, using the raster calculator with a conditional expression to isolate the highest peaks, which corresponds to tree tops. Finally, we convert the rasters into vector shape files with the raster to point tool. This process allows flexibility and can be adapted to different landscapes. The key is to test several neighborhood sizes, analyze the results and choose the one that best represents the reality of the study area. That concludes this tutorial. I hope this video was useful and that you can apply this workflow in your own GIS projects. Thank you for watching. If you like this type of content, don't forget to like, subscribe and comment what you want to learn next.